I'm happy to introduce Dr. Brandon Marin to Molecular Podcasting. Brandon is an R&D engineer at Intel in Arizona. In full disclosure, Brandon was a PhD student of mine in chemical engineering at UC San Diego. He's also a close friend. Brandon is an example of someone with whom I share a convergent trajectory. That is, we were born three months apart in 1983, and our kids were born three weeks apart in 2019. We're both uber nerds with a passion for sci-fi, fantasy, and The Simpsons. However, Brandon's life took a rather significant meander into the dark world of addiction and the criminal justice system. As you will hear him when he tells his story, I'm sure you'll agree with me that Brandon has been through the depths of despair that would probably have killed a lesser human. However, Brandon's story is an extraordinary inspiration. He eventually recovered and, and uh, not only earned his PhD, but is now the inventor on a mountain of patents at his current employer. So I would like to start uh, with the question that I ask all my guests. Actually, you're the first one. Uh, wh <laughs> what was your favorite library book growing up and why was it the Star Trek The Next Generation technical manual? I think... Uh... So I love that. So the technical manual, actually, you, you, you brought up a good point. I actually pulled it off of the racks at the library. I used to go to um, um, the Oak Ridge uh, Library in Chino Hills when I was in elementary school. And I pulled it off and I immediately asked my mom if she could get it for me for Christmas. And, and she did. And I think what I loved about that manual so much is I was so hooked on that show episode by episode. And just, just the whole um franchise in general like it gave me the depth of knowledge that i needed to satisfy my curiosity with the show like i i wasn't satisfied with just knowing like you know that the ncc 1701d could go to warp 9.9997 like i needed to know all the specifications in it and that's kind of probably why i became an engineer like <laughs> And yeah, and what was cool about the, the manual, like I tell you things that weren't on the show too, like extra tidbits, like that, that like the Enterprise, like had actually like a, a dolphin wing, like that had dolphins that they trained and it actually took up like a significant portion of like the ship. And they, they even had a whale, I think. Did they have a Lewis dot structure of dilithium in there? We actually had, we had the book too. I remember it because my my mom is a librarian, and we had the uh, the copy that was torn along the backbone, and it had the the packing tape that was keeping all the pages together. Even though I think a hundred percent of the damage was probably caused by me. <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, where you grew up. Yeah. Sure. I grew up in um, Los Angeles, California. Um, my family is second uh, generation. My grandparents were born in, um, in Mexico. And uh, my grandfather immigrated to the U.S. Uh, during World War II. He fought for, um, in Europe. And then, uh, actually, I pulled it up off of Ancestry.com. He got his citizenship in um, Alabama at, like, an army uh, base. They basically... Back then, like, all you needed to do to be a citizen is just sign over your life to the military, and they gave you the citizenship document right there on the spot. Um, I grew up in L.A., um, and uh, I think um, my family's always, like, lived in that area, too. Um, I went to high school in um, uh, Belmont and um, a couple other high schools in the L.A. area, but I finally graduated from West Covina, um, in uh, South Hills High School in West Covina. And my family moved there when I was in uh, sophomore year of, of high school. And that's actually, my mom wanted me to go to better school. The LA Unified School District has metal detectors like <laughs> in its school. So she didn't really think it was the best. Not to say that um, South Hills was much better, I think like um, from the quality of the education, but I think, you know, it was just definitely a better neighborhood. Yeah. What what kind of friends did you have in high school, and what sort of crowd did you uh, did you hang out with? Yeah, so when I was in high school, um, I was a skateboarder in high school, like one of those skater kids. Um, I kind of lived a double life because I was I was a nerd, like behind closed doors, like I was in all the AP classes, and I was like in the calculus club and the um, um, the chemistry club. But then I was also sponsored for skateboarding at the time um by utility board shop and me and i think i was the only person that was sponsored at our high school so 
back then, if you were good at skateboarding, you were like popular. But then also too, like I was kind of like the um, antithesis of it too, because I was also in all the smart kid classes, like, um, you know, and, and um, I actually did really well at, at my high school. Um, I, I led the calculus club for a while because I was the only person my year to get like a five on the calculus um, um, AP exam. And uh, you've bested it, me, sir. Yeah, <laughs> I, I obtained a mere chemistry. four. <laughs> yeah, I got a four on chemistry, though. I don't know how you <laughs> them, but, but that was uh, my only five was English. I don't know what that what that tells you about me. That makes sense. <laughs> so because you're a great writer. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> an well, orator. You, you flatter me. You flatter <laughs> me. Uh, so when you applied to college, you stayed in the L.A. area. Um, tell me about your decision. You know, why did you go where you went? Yeah, I really wanted to go to Caltech, um, but Caltech has a very, very rigorous um, vetting program for their undergrads, um, for those out there who know that. Um, it's much easier to get into Caltech for grad than undergrad, and I got rejected, and I remember it just sunk me because I, I wanted, you know, because just being a sci-fi nerd, like, you know, everybody talks about, like, Caltech, like, even, like, in in sci-fi culture and it's kind of like the center of of uh of scientific progress and i ended up getting rejected my second choice was usc and i remember the week in between like my first letter letter was from caltech and the second one was from usc um i was just so depressed because i'm like i'm just gonna get a slew of rejects you know um and the next one i got was from usc and they accepted me and I didn't even bother looking at my next choices. Most of them were local schools. Um, my family, we couldn't afford out of state tuition. So I had to go, I was, I was really looking at something in state and USC at that time, they had a lot of money for, um, for my, for like financial aid for minority students and, you know, um, and people that were local. So, so that was actually what I ended up choice choosing as my university, but it was kind of a double edged sword because, um, as I'll, I'll get into it later, like that staying in the LA area probably wasn't the best thing um, for me socially. But, uh, but yeah, that's, I ended up making that choice because financial, um, because of financial decisions. But yeah. And how did you choose your major? Chemical engineering, you know, the reason I ask is that it's, it's not uh, something that high school students really know that much about. They kind of know, they kind of think it's like applied chemistry, but, you know, we don't go into that choice with a lot of information. I know. Yeah. Um, for me, actually, I really wanted to do civil engineering because when I was a kid, I used to, I mean, at first I wanted to be an architect. I used to draw buildings and structures and, you know, I, I actually learned a little bit of statics when I was uh, in high school because I really liked um, buildings and architecture so much, but it was, uh, it was kind of a doofus move. Um, I bubbled in my, my acceptance, um, application where you have to actually back then you used to bubble in manually, like your major code. And for some reason I put, um, I think it was C E N G instead of, um, C H E U S C. And that was, I thought was chemical and or civil engineering, but it was actually, um, chemical engineering oops um was, is a chge and uh and ended, i ended up they ended up auto enrolling me in all the courses and i showed up at usc and started taking the courses i'm like wait a minute i'm not even supposed to be in this and i went to the um the department advisor at the time it was karen Wu. um she's i don't think she's there anymore at usc but um at the department chair at the time um katherine shing who is still there um she's a thermal professor still I was there complaining, I need to be in chemical and or civil engineering. I'm not supposed to be here. I actually I came in and she told me that, uh, that nobody stays in civil engineering, uh, chemical engineering, that everyone flunks out of it. I took that as like a personal challenge. Like, uh, what, you know, like I, at, at that point I was like, well, you know, I can, I can do anything I put my mind to. I'll, I'll take these courses and we'll see how it goes, you know? And, and I ended up loving it. I, I didn't realize because I love chemistry in undergrad and I love math. And chemical engineering is like the perfect mix of those two. And I guess it was just serendipity because it, I guided me into the major that I still to this day really, really love. And I think you, you can attest to that. Like um, I've always liked teaching it. I've always liked um, studying it. And I think I'm kind of right where I need to be.
Yeah, I, I can sympathize. I mean, being a trained chemist, but now being a professor of chemical engineering, <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've enjoyed the extent to which I've been I've been adopted into your uh, your intellectual family. <laughs> um, so you you came to USC thinking that you were a civil engineer, and then you were surprised with the chemical engineering courses. But what uh, what surprised you socially? Like when you showed up at your dorm room, who was there and what was going yeah, on? Yeah. So I went. I remember I showed up in my dorm, and I was like, so. I kind of didn't mention this before, but when I was in under, when I was in high school, like I used to experiment with drugs, like, you know, and at the time everybody um, that I knew kind of, uh, kind of did, you know, especially being a skateboarder and stuff and, you know, in the party scene, that's, that's kind of what you did. And, you know, like I experimented with, a, you know, like meth and, and acid and some other things like when I was in high school. And then I was like, no, okay, now that I got in a good school, like now I really got to put like my tires on the tracks. Like now I got to really quit doing this, this, you know, this little weekend drinking weekend, like um, partying thing. Cause now I'm going to go to college and, and you know, the college scene is where you find out what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You know, you don't waste your time on drugs and alcohol and things in college. At least <laughs> that's what I thought. And um, I remember my first day I moved into my dorm in, in party tower right there off of Figueroa no pun intended, uh, party with a D. And um, I got my bags and I moved into five of my, my dorm room, 505. And um, I opened the door and my roommate was there. He was an aerospace engineer. And I said, hi, my name's Brandon. I said, he said, hi, my name's Jason. And he's like, so, uh, so you want to get wasted? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, let's, let's get wasted. And it was like three in the afternoon. And, and that's when it just hit like, you know, it was like a really, really heavy party scene in the dorms when I was a, a freshman and, and it accelerated really, really fast from that point on. And I think, um, I, um, should I just get into like, so what happened to your, what happened with your schoolwork at that point? Yeah. I mean, it, it went down. I, I was man, I managed to keep it together for a couple quarter, uh, semesters. And, um, but by the second semester, the, I, I was drinking so much. And at this point I started like um, um, messing around with heroin, which was uh, a hell of a drug. Um, really, really um, tightly gripped me. And um, my, my grades just went down the tube at that point because at that point I was no longer going to class. This is freshman year, second semester? Or... This was actually um, second semester of freshman year. Yeah. Mm. So um, I, I tried to hang on for a couple more semesters, but at that point it was like, I was, I was enrolling for classes and not showing up for them. Like, you know, wasting, you know, tuition money and then just selling, you know, doing weird things like, um, you know, making drugs at home with the knowledge that I learned, like in school, like it was, it got really, really bad really, really fast. And at that point too, I also started getting caught um, up by the law, like started getting possession charges. And I think at that point, like school was like an alibi more than it was like a purpose, like for my family, like um, I would tell them that I was at school, but really I was just doing my own thing, trying to get drugs. Um, and for me that, that, you know, long story short, after about a year and a half of being in school, like I had no money. Um, I was getting evicted from my, my, um, my dorm, my apartment at the time, because at this point, the dorms, the, U the USC um, housing, student housing association just like kicked me out because I was just a, a nightmare in there, like um, just destroying things. And um, so what were, what were some of the, like the the charges like you know other than just being a like a personal disaster yeah so th that's actually a funny story because uh the office of judicial affairs one day left a letter on my on my um on my apartment door with all the charges they were charging with me um and i um one of them was actually inciting mayhem <laughs> which was like it seems like a batman like <laughs> like a batman charge you know like because uh, and inciting a, a di dis, uh, disorderly conduct because we used to have these like crazy parties in my dorm and do things like throw the water fountains out the window and like throw 40 bottles out the window. And then the Department of Public Safety just just um, knew our dorm room is just the trouble dorm room. But I got this letter with like 
um, mayhem. Um, um, it was um, inciting disorderly conduct, like possession of drugs, um, destruction of university property. It just went on and on and on. And then at that point, this university was like, okay, we're not going to interact with you anymore. You know, we're going to suspend you um, until further notice. And, um, and yeah, and you're not allowed on campus. Like, you need to really get your life together. And at that point, I was so numb. Like, the drugs had just kind of um, pretty much just numbed my mind to any consequence. I just didn't even care. So this is like, like every day you were, like, you were getting high every day. Yeah. At this point, this was 2003. Um, I was getting high every single day at this point. And keep in mind that number, 2003. Like, um, every day was basically... Um, as soon as I woke up, it was how, what do I need to do today to get high? And at 21 years old, um, 20 years old, that is like a really, really horrible place to be. Um, cause at that point I felt like an 80 year old man and I was still going to campus, even though I wasn't allowed there because I could use my, the fact that people knew me to get money and resources to get drugs. And one time I got caught on campus I was on, I actually was just sleeping in the library because at this point I didn't have anywhere to stay. And they pulled me out of the library, the DPS officers, and they're like, you need to come with us. And at this point I had warrants out for my arrest. Um, so I was like, they're going to call the cops and the cops are going to pull my record and they're going to, they're going to take me in. And I went out and they pulled me into McCarthy quad. It's right outside of the library. And everybody, um, McCarthy quad is kind of a intersection in campus. There's tons of people like walking back and forth in that area. And I remember being in handcuffs there and seeing all these people that I knew, these people that I like took student orientation with and people that I had classes in my GEs with, and they all just saw me there, just, you know, skinny as a rail, like handcuffs on my hands, you know, like, um, and it was just so pitiful and, and demoralizing. And I just remember thinking to myself, every single cell in my body, I wanted to get sober and I wanted to stop living that way. And I just, you know, I just had made a decision at that point. I was like, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to stay sober. And what happened was the cops came, they took me, I went to jail and I got out and I went right back to that life. Can, can I, can I interrupt for just a second? Um, so there, I read this book a couple of years ago by Johan Hari called Chasing the Scream. And he talks about two different mechanisms of addiction like the chemical hook on one hand and then the despair on you know the the desperation on the other hand and he gives the example of people in the uk medical system who get like medical grade heroin as an analgesic if you break your femur or something and how a very small fraction of those people actually end up addicted, you know, minuscule fraction. And, and I'm wondering if you have, uh, you know, in any, any insight, like what, what is the, what are the, what are the pre factors for, for those mechanisms? Like, is, is that a thing or is it a hundred percent chemical hook for you? Or was there desperation under underneath? Yeah, honestly, I think it's a certain type of person. Um, I mean, I don't think it's well understood either by academia or just the, the, the population who has this disease as a whole. But I mean, the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what I, I the program that I used to get sober, described it very, um, very broadly as like there's a spiritual component and there's also like a chemical component, like how you, how you, you talk about. For me, kind of as a scientist, um, and as a, uh, as a researcher, to me, I really think there is like, there is a certain biochemistry in an addict's brain that is unique to that specific type of brain. And I don't think that the majority of, of population of the population has that. And I think for those specific people, maybe, maybe those, those pathways in your brain have to do with the pleasure reward system of the brain or motivation or something. But it affects, I think, that small percentage differently than um, the rest of the population. I think that was what accounts for the majority of people. Just they take it and they just use it as its function. 
and they go they go about their merry way whereas uh, there's that small percentage where as soon as it hits it, there's something else that lights up in the brain where it's like no i can use this for this or i need this for this and um and yeah it's like i think it's something as simple as people who like gravitate towards art versus mathematics you know it's just a certain predisposition mm -hmm. in the brain and um yeah but then there's also that spiritual component like you mentioned that um th that depression and i think for that that is um something also something that also needs to change in the brain in order for someone to recover with that type of personality because um there are a lot of personality um, dysfunctions that, that come along with the addiction, the stealing, the lying, the, um, the aggression, the, um, the manipulation, all of that is something that the disease uses. And then eventually the, the addict has to unlearn in order to reintegrate back into society. And I think that's, that's an interesting part because that, that part seems like it's temporary, but the chemical part is, is permanent. Like I have, I don't have to experiment with this because I know that if I go out tomorrow and I do heroin again, it's been almost, um, it's been like 13 years since I, I've been sober. But if I go out tomorrow, I know that that same part of my brain that got lit up by, by so many years ago will go right back to normal. And I haven't experimented with it myself, but I've heard another enough people through self-help 12 step program meetings to, know that that was what will happen so mm -hmm. the logic part of my brain understands that enough to be like okay you have it pretty good now you probably shouldn't mess around with that so sure. yeah so it's interesting that you, you brought that up that's yeah. how i see it well thank you for indulging me on that uh that uh, really important uh, aspect um i want to let you freeform a little bit to fill in the the next um the next four years uh, and I'll kind of stop you along the way if, uh, if I, if I'm, you know, curious for, for any clarification, but, uh, so what, what happened in, in 2003, you got kicked out of the dorm, suspended from USC. Why didn't they just terminate your students, your enrollment? You know, why, why was it just a suspension? Cause this is relevant later. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think, so for me, uh, it's actually interesting that you bring that up. It brings up like a lot of emotions because kind of looking at how my life is now and how I felt back then brings, um, brings up a lot of memories of, of how it felt to be in that position. But um, they, um, they didn't expel me because um, they, want, they wanted to give me a second chance. And there was, USC has a problem with addiction. There's no stranger to addiction. Um, I mean, even... 15, 20 years ago, that's apparent even to this day. I mean, USC is very culturally in the center of Los Angeles. You know, there's a lot of scandal around the school because of things that like professors have done. So, so they were very familiar with my predicament. So they didn't outright expel me. They basically said, we'll, we'll give you, um, we're going to suspend you and see how you do. We know you have some problems going on with the law so <laughs> maybe the law will help you sort that out and and it was really the judicial system the los angeles superior court judicial system that got me on track i had a judge um kind of going back to that point where i was at the library and i really wanted to stay sober in 2003 like i mentioned i really wanted to stay sober but i i went off and i went running for for many more years and um and from 2003 to 2007, it was basically, um, I was in and out of jail and homeless for the majority of it. And um, all the cases that I had built up were being managed by this judge named Michael, uh, Michael Tynan, who I still keep in contact with today. I, I email him periodically. He's the judge who sentenced Richard Ramirez to death, a night stalker um, in Los Angeles. So he's a pretty famous judge, like Judge Ito. And, um, he decided to stop doing high profile cases like that criminal court started doing drug court and he basically um he was hard on me um i used to say that i would go to AA meetings and i used to forge my card thinking that this was like some revolutionary thing i figured out how to beat the system and he would pull me to court and then look at the meetings that i was making up and then pull out an AA directory and be like you're not going to these meetings these meetings don't even exist 
and he would say, bailiff, remand this man for 60 days, and he'd throw me in jail for 60 days. So I learned very quickly not to lie to him. Um, and it's going it, to, it's, by the way, it's going to come as a complete surprise, I think, to most people, the extent to which a judge uh, is, is intervening and has a personal uh, reason to, to see his, you know, the people in his charge reformed, his or her charge reformed. Right. And, and Judge Tynan is, is very much like that. If you go and Google his name, you'll find lots of articles about people like me and how the, a lot of the Los Angeles community knows him for, for caring like that. And he, he knew I went to USC and he went to USC too, I, I believe, an undergrad. And he was like, I know you have a lot of potential and I know you could turn your life around. So, and um, in 2007, he's like, I'm going to give you one last chance. If I see you again, you're going to go to prison and, and that's it. Like no more chances. And once you go to prison, your life will be very different after that, you know? And, um, you know, right now you have some felonies, but you haven't, you're not on um, parole and, you know, I don't want to kill your life like that. And I went out and to this rehab he sent me to, and I, I, I jumped out of the window. Can, can I ask you for a, a slightly more fine grained uh, version of what happened in the courtroom? Your mom was there too. Oh, right, right, right. Um, yeah, I th I know what you're talking about too. Um, because um, it's actually a separate judge that story happened with. So Judge Tynan told me he would send me to prison. And then what ended up happening was um, I went to the rehab and I, I escaped. And then I was like, he's going to send me to prison when I see him again. So I went back, you know, eventually I got caught up and, um, and went back to uh, back to court. Um, at this point, I was so defeated. It was um, 2007. I really, really didn't have anything going for me. And I was bankrupt emotionally and, and spiritually and, um, and physically. And then I called my mom and I was like, okay, Judge Tynan's going to send me to prison. So can you please take me to court and just let me just turn myself in. I need somebody to do something with my life, even if it means you know, the CDC, the, um, the Department of Corrections in California, like if it has to be the prison system that does it, let's do it. So pre previously, it was only it was, I don't mean to say only it was county jail, right for and how long were you? Uh, how many different stints? And how much time did that add up to between 03 and 07? So uh, between 03 and 07, I probably racked up about a year and a half in county. Um, yeah, just in and out, one month here, three months here, five months here, go to Wayside, go to, you know, um, Supermax for some reason, like bouncing around like the, the county jails. And um, there's a Supermax county jail. That... Yeah, well, there's a there's a jail called Supermax in um, in Wayside, which is the jail that's on the way to Magic Mountain in L.A. And uh, that's the main county jail for for Los Angeles County. And there's an area called Supermax, which is like the area that they send people who are eventually going to go to prison. And I would get transferred there like randomly. <laughs> like, um, I don't understand how the, 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 the prison system, the county system works with how they, they um, move people around. But I would go, I would be there quite often. And they would um, be people there that were going, they had life sentences and murderers, rapists, you know. Um, How many people in jail did you encounter who were familiar with the uh, Star Trek The Next Generation technical manual? Like how how, how odd was it to have somebody like you there? Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty, it was pretty sparingly. Actually, when every, any time that I, it was actually kind of funny because I would sometimes bring it up in conversations like, oh, I'm actually like, going to I was going to USC for chemical engineering I'm actually pretty smart and actually I'm not supposed to be here at all you know <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, this is just a temporary thing while I figure out my life yeah like like you're a frequent flyer sitting and coach exactly yeah yeah I'm supposed to be on the other side of the of the curtain I'm supposed to make the left when I go into the plane not the right <laughs> and uh, yeah it's I was very sparingly but I guess these were starting to become my people and if, sure. And you probably learned a lot from them, too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, um, like, it's it's just such a weird walk of life to, to kind of encounter those types of people. And I still remember a lot of the stories I heard from those people, um, you know, and 
my life was definitely heading for something that was, um, you know, people in there were like 50, 60, 40, you know, at this time, again, I'm still in my twenties. So they would, you know, call me a baby and be like, you know, like <laughs> you still got the rest of your life. You know, like I was in and out of the system when I was your age and I started then, you know, now look at me, you know, fully tatted up and <laughs> living the good life in prison, you know, and, you know, a lot of times those people are, they're in and out so much that um, they don't know how to function even outside because they spent more time in there than they've spent out, you know, and, and, and that's kind of, that's a, that's a sad place to be, but that's the way our um, prison systems even are, are in California. I mean, there's more people in prison in California than the majority of countries on this planet. Yeah, that's that's third. One state, which is a separate conversation entirely, but um and also the system enforces uh, with whom you can associate, right? Because you were telling me that as um, that as a uh, Mexican American citizen, you had to affiliate with a certain cohort, right? Um, and there's four cohorts in there. There's um, uh, the Woods, which are uh, the white people, um, the Blacks, uh, the uh, paisas, which are all the Mexicans that are not born in um, in the U.S., and then there's the Southsiders, which are like the cholos, gangsters. Um, they call it four cars, and because I was actually born in the U.S., um, you know, and not like in a U.S. citizen, but not in a gang, I would have to associate with the Southsiders, who oftentimes like ran their, you know, and it wasn't like it was just like this club like ralph's you know like where you occasionally used it they would actually require you to do things like work out if there would be a mass fight you would have to jump in and if you were not seen um on the right side or involved in this fight then you would get beat up by your own people later and um yeah it's called the politics of of this of prison and or jail and um it was very annoying because there's a lot of rules that I didn't know about when I got in there. You know, I would share my food with people of other races and that's like a big no, no. And I would get my ass kicked for like, um, 26 seconds is kind of like the penalty for, for sharing food with them. Um, How badly did you get injured for this kind of infraction? I'm sorry. Say that again. How badly did you get injured? Oh, um, not, not too bad. No broken bones or anything, but you know, bloody nose and lots of, welts and bruises on my face because they would it would be usually three people on one and uh, they would pick the three at random and they'd usually pick the three biggest people and they'd count for 26 seconds and they'd just you know um just beat you while you were down until it was up and that was it um yeah and i i got a lot of infractions like that for not knowing certain things like uh, making my bed the right way or getting caught not working out like that was another thing you had to work out every day and when you're coming off of drugs it's not something you want to do so <laughs> so uh you know they would keep track it was like a little he was like a little like um, um army sergeant the guy who would uh, keep track of whether you worked out and he would report you and then you get your ass kicked for not working out so it was uh quite a different system though than, than what i'm living today but uh but yeah there's, there's a lot of politics in jail um and yeah, you pretty much have to stick with your race and that specific car cohort that you're associated with. And if you don't, then there's severe consequences. So no. getting your ass kicked is not the only thing too. like, um, you know, people get stabbed in there for other types of infractions. And um, yeah, it's it's a uh, kind of a dark place. Yeah. Uh, one one more question before uh, before moving back to the courtroom um, in in this period between 03 and 07, uh, when you were going in and out of jail, what were some of the uh, the infractions and, and convictions that you had? What were those for? Yeah, so um, I have GTA on my record, Grand Theft Auto, because I stole a car at uh, The Hat. Um, it's a really nice pastrami joint in um, Alhambra. Um, have you been back since? <laughs> I have, actually. <laughs> I've been there with my wife and... Um, I go there actually, I went there quite regularly when I was working in, in um, a Baxter after I finished undergrad. Um, but I was there waiting for this drug guy to show up and then there was a BMW that pulled up and it was a convertible and 
the guy left, went and got pastrami, and I took off with his card. You know, it didn't make – this wasn't like – there was no end game in that decision. It was just completely impulsive, and I took off. And actually, the way I got caught, interestingly, was I, I parked in a sheriff's parking lot, and the, the low jack was on. And I didn't know I was parking in a sheriff's parking lot. I just turned a random corner. And I was like, I'll just park here and leave the car. And then I looked and there were cop cars around me. <laughs> and then this sheriff came out and he was like, hey, you're not supposed to park here. And his partner was turning on the car. And every cop car has a low jack system detector on their dash. And it beeps like crazy when, when there's a, a stolen car by them. The guy turned on his car and immediately started going beep, 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 beep. And he's like, wait, 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 you, you wait right there. And <laughs> I got caught up and then the sheriff was like, you have to be one of the dumbest people I've ever met. And hopefully the judge just lets you off for, you know, doing this dumb decision. Cause you brought the car right back to us that we were <laughs> looking for. And, um, so that's one I have, uh, numerous. Uh, you realize I'm only laughing because you're laughing, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, it's actually a funny story. I mean, in hindsight, I mean, it's hilarious. I mean, when it was happening, I was... Like, that's like sitcom territory. That's like, that's uh, Arrested Development territory. Like Kramer. Yeah. <laughs> Something Kramer would do. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and um, lots of uh, possession charges, uh, trespassing. Um, USC used to get me with trespassing charges whenever I would show up, wander on the campus when I was high. So a lot of felonies that eventually got... Um, um, got uh, expunged later on in my years but but yeah yeah so, i think all together um i have two felony um charges but they weren't ended up in they didn't end up in convictions and about six misdemeanors all together so yeah quite a record that even people in arizona still bring up today um when i get pulled over every now and then <laughs> um okay sorry there's one other one other point so you were uh your relationship with your family had kind of deteriorated during this time. Is that right? So, because you said you were living on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I, I don't want to ask too much about your family, but what about the, like living on the street? Like what, what was that? Uh, what was that like? That was different. I mean, I don't think if anybody knows out there, but uh, when you're homeless, you get smelly really, really fast <laughs> when you're not living in the comforts of your home um, or a daily shower. And you start to realize why people, there's a certain smell in downtown LA, the homeless smell. And you, I, you know, I recognize it still to this day when I smell it around, but um, it's um, like you mentioned, I mean, at, at this point, my family, my relationships with my family had deteriorated to a point where nobody wanted anything to do with me. Nobody wanted to talk to me. No one wanted to um, give me any resources of any kind. Nobody wanted, I mean, my family just turned their back on me and, and they rightfully did because I was manipulative and I would just use their love for me as a weapon against them to, to basically, you know, carve out my addiction even farther. And, um, you know, so after a while, I was homeless in L.A. I was living on the um, uh, living off of um, um, Broadway and 8th. I would sleep under an overhang. Usually that was the place I would sleep. Um, the show, shops would cl close up about seven and I get my cardboard box and then and sleep there. And um, and yeah, I would beg for change and um, and do really masterful criminal um um acts like <laughs> like steal the, the tip shop uh, tip jar at starbucks you know that was like my <laughs> that was my um uh my gig like that i would do like to to make extra money here and there and i remember one time i went and i took the starbucks chip jar and it was it was tied by a rope to like the actual counter so i ran off with it and then the rope you know it snapped and tight and then like the chains just flew everywhere and i just i just ran it was like a cartoon scene you know um but this is what i would uh this is the kind of life that i i i, I lived in um i think the uh parking in the sheriff's parking lot uh takes the cake but that's a close second yeah yeah it is um but um after i mean i was living i mean being homeless i mean i really didn't understand how bad i had um 
my, my physical health had gotten until I sobered up when I, I, you know, realized how blistered my feet were and how sunburnt my skin was, you know, from slipping and slip, like sleeping on the streets for, for so long. And, um, you know, I got used to that life really quickly, which was really scary because at that point, at, you know, in my twenties, like thinking that this is what God has in store for me. This is my, this is the story of Brandon homeless in downtown LA talking about how, you know, I really have a lot of potential. I'm actually really smart while I'm sitting there smoking crack. Yeah. And, and the first time we, so the, the reason that I, that, that I asked you to go on this kind of 15 minute to 15 minutes to fill in the hole here is because I learned this story from you for the first time when we were on a trip from San Diego to, uh, to, to MRS, uh, in, in, uh, Phoenix. And um, I, I had not known any of this. I had known precisely zero. And I think the, uh, the, the crux of the story is what happened in the courtroom um, and, uh, and your mom in the courtroom. So I, want, I wanted to make sure that, that, we, that, that all of the em emotional weight is behind this moment before, uh, before you describe what happened there. Yeah, no problem. And, and for those who are listening too, um, this is a very appended form because I don't know if you remember, but we were driving for five hours. Uh, yes. We were, so we were talking, we were talking for literally five hours. It took five hours to me to describe to you probably about like not even half of what I, the whole story is. Cause I've, I've given you more bits and, and pieces as we, you know, our friendship has grown over the years, but, but yeah, I think, um, so what you're talking about, um, is the moment I went back into that courtroom thinking that judge Tynan was going to send me to prison for five years. And I, I wanted to go to prison and Tynan was sick that day. Um, he still remembers actually that day that he was sick <laughs> because, um, I bring it up a lot. And there's another judge, Judge Dorothy Reyes. And um, my mom was like, she was relieved that I was turning myself in and I was going to go to prison. Um, you know, that, that finally someone was going to have me locked up like for a good amount of time so I could sober up. And Judge Reyes, she saw my file and she was like, well, Mr. Moran, I'm going to give you one more chance. Um, I think if you go to this new rehab um, or this, this other rehab called Warm Springs, I think this would do um, a lot of good for you. So I'll give you a choice. Do you want to go to prison or do you want to go try it one more time and go to rehab? And I was sitting there with the handcuffs on and I turned around. My mom was like sitting there. She's like, like miming to me, go to prison, go to prison. <laughs> and I turned around and I was like, I want to go to rehab. I want to try this one more time. And then my mom was like, ah, oh, you know, like, he's going to, you know, cause she, she heard the story a thousand times and I went in and, and something, you know, and I, they, they locked me up and I went to that rehab and that's where things really changed for me. That was, that day was March 9th of 2007. Um, I remember that because that was the last time I got high or, or, or drank. Um, the next day, March 10th, 2007 would be my sobriety date. And I've been sober um, ever since. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, from that point, I, I found Alcoholics Anonymous of that rehab. I, I put every effort into that program that I put into my PhD, my job, every, every peer reviewed publication, like that same fervor and drive that I put into those things, I put into Alcoholics Anonymous. I tried to be an academic and just apply all that, that, you know, that, those gifts that I had to AA so that I could learn this thing because I really needed something to work. And it, and it did, it, it really did. I mean, people can scoff at like 12 step programs, but for me, it's the only thing that's worked. And I mean, today, I mean, it's been a long time. It's been 13 years, but I mean, like you mentioned, I mean, <laughs> I met you like five years later, you know, when I was, um, after I got sober, I mean, I got, um, I mean, I, I eventually expunged my record. I did everything the court told me to do. And then they released me from probation. I went to USC and I'm like, can I come back to school? And they gave me a long list of things I needed to do before coming back. And I did every single one of them, checked them off. Something that was like unfathomable, uh, like, like to me, like when I was younger, like when I was an addict, I could not do one thing you asked me to. 
but this long 20 line list of things that, that, that USC gave me to do, which was like community service, um, volunteer at, at a, a program for 12 months, uh, take five classes at a, at a, at a call career, um, a community college to prove that you still can go to school. I, I did every single one of those things line by line on line. And then I turned it into the office of judicial affairs and they're like, okay, we'll enroll you again. That's incredible. Judge, yeah. Um, Professor Theodore Thotsis, uh, uh at USC, he's a reactor engineering professor. He remembers when I was high in those classes and, you know, he remembers like my addiction and what it did to me. And he was there to welcome me back. And he was like, I remember him telling me this, you know, it's like to overcome what you need to overcome is going to take nothing but fortitude on your part and to get where you want to go um is going to take 10 times more effort than somebody who has you know not done any of the things you've done you know because of the wreckage you caused and i was like i understand that and i'm i'm willing to do that so um yeah i mean you've seen my transcripts when i applied from usc to ucsd there's like a striation there this is so yeah um and and yeah, I, I do want to I do want to talk about that in a second. But going back to rehab for just a just a second, um, how many people were in your cohort? Oh yeah, at Warm Springs, um, which is no longer open, it's a county rehab. When I went in, I mean, this will kind of give you an idea of, of the disease of addiction and exactly what um, how pervasive it is and how deadly it is. Um, we were, there was two hundred people in my rehab. And over the four months that I spent there, I got to know every single one of those people very well because that you have nothing else to do. And over, just like jail, I mean, you know, like you, you say you're gonna keep in contact, we're gonna go to meetings together. We're gonna like, when we get out, we're, we're gonna do this, we're gonna surf, you know. Um, out of those 200 people, um, two years ago, there was only two people that were sober from all of that, me and my friend Shane. Now, to this day, I am the only one that I know of that stayed sober the, like since that time, which like literally freaks me out, like even just saying that right now, because I mean, my, my son's in the other room, my, my 16 month old son, my wife, I mean, I'm in this house that I actually own, like, and if you were to tell me that if I had a, a fishbowl of 200 marbles, and you know, there's one black marble in it, and then I would, like, if you were to tell me that, like, you would bet your life on picking that black marble out of that fishbowl, you know, that I would say, like, like you don't have a chance in hell. Like, I'm not going to take yeah. that. And you did bet your life on picking that black marble out of the fishbowl. Yeah, I did. I did. Like, I really did. And it's it, it freaks me out because it's like, I don't know why, like, well, I, I do know why, but it's just it really makes you appreciate that there is something greater than just what you physically see. I mean, I, it, you know, AA, AA really brought out a spiritual side for me. And I feel like, you know, what I call God, you know, you know, the universal consciousness or whatever fate, whatever you want to call it. Like, I believe that there is a plan for me and because there is a plan for me, which involves, which I feel is helping people. I want, I need to help people, you know, either learn, you know, whether it's like through my, my scientific part of my life or whether it is recovery, like getting sober, whatever it is, I need to help people. And that's, that is what, you know, why that marble, that black marble was picked out of this fishbowl because this black marble has, you know, a purpose I need, you know, and it has a great purpose. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, that's the only reason, that's the only way I can rationalize why I'm still sober today, you know, um, because that there is like a, a purpose for me to help other people and that God has a plan for me. Um, and this, and this drive not only uh, allowed you to complete your degree at USC, um, but also to want to apply to a PhD program. And how did, how did that work out? Yeah, I mean, I... When I was a, when I was reading that 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 Star Trek technical manual, I was I always wanted. I mean, I read, you know a lot of the the citations in there are from PhDs. You know, PhDs actually you know physicists actually made that thing. You know, and I remember thinking like I want to get a PhD one day. Like 
I want to go all the way with my education. And I remember when I was homeless, I was like, well, so much for that, you know, <laughs> and thinking about how I had just beat up my life so much um, that there was no way I was going to get that back. And I remember when I got sober, this was my, my bar. My bar was like, I'm just going to get a job at Big Lots and I'll just stay there for the rest of my life. Because that, you know, just having a small job and just being sober was so much better than the life I lived. This whole dreams that I had when I was a kid, I knew that I had probably washed all that away and there was no way I could get any of that back. So I was cool with like the fact that, yeah, maybe I'll just get this mundane existence and I'll be happy with that because anything is better than me than the, than the hell of addiction. And, you know, like you like, like you mentioned, I mean, this program and sobriety and this, like I've gotten so much more from that. Like I actually, you know, when I finished my degree at USC, which I thought I wouldn't be able to do, um, Andrea Armani, who, you know, you know, she, she said, you should apply to grad school. And, you know, I remember telling Noah, my, my undergrad advisor, I worked in his lab, like uh, my GPA isn't that good. And he's like, well, let's just try it, like Brandon, let's just see what, what happens. And if you can't get in anywhere, we'll figure it out then, <laughs> you know, and yeah, what a great attitude. Yeah. And, and, you know, other professors, they were, they were a little bit harsher. They were like, you're wasting your money on this. And I didn't ask them for, <laughs> you know, I, I sure actually, I think, you know, who those professors are, but um, I, I basically just went on the side of positivity. I was like, we know, I know definitely if I don't try, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. And I tried, I got into USC, UCSD and, you know, Andrea took me and Andrea Tao took me into her lab and, you know, and there was, um, she, she worked with me on that. Actually, she, um, she said, you know, your, your, your um, background is, is patchy, like with your undergrad, yeah. re undergrad record, like, um, sometimes you need a champion. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, she was like, um, can you tell me a little bit about that? And I, I told you in a couple of paragraphs, what I just spilled, mm -hmm. you know, verbal diarrhea during this <laughs> podcast. Mm -hmm. But, um, and she was like, that's really, really commendable. Like, you know what, like, um, I'll, I look forward to seeing you here and working with you. And, and yeah, I mean, she, she worked with me to, you know, to, to get into this program. And I, she, I remember she asked me for, um, she told me, she was like, I hope you can, um, you know, I hope that you, I hope that you make it worth it. Basically. Like she, she said, um, I hope that uh, that you show everybody that taking a chance on you was not um, was was worth it. You know what I mean? Like because you know we're going to reject some students that have you know great backgrounds because you know for you because you told us our, your story. And I mean, I haven't. I mean, I, I chat with Andrea still to this day, and I haven't asked her about that. But I feel like I, I delivered on that because. <laughs> You know, I didn't, I, I finished the program. I, I, I tried to volunteer. I tried to be the best graduate student I could. Yeah. I remember the, so this went, went, uh, went down with, uh, professor, uh, Andrea Tao a few months actually before I arrived because we actually started at UCSD at the same time and you were in my class. Um, and you sat in the front row and, uh, I remember the first time we had really a, a personal interaction was when about two weeks into the, uh, the quarter, the basement flooded and you had, uh, come up and, and alerted me as, you know, the only, I don't know, the faculty member with his door open on a Saturday morning. And you, you told me that, you know, don't worry, the, uh, the appropriate authorities have been alerted and the fire department was on its way <laughs> and, <laughs> and building and grounds came. And I think my, um, you know, I think, I think the, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the median person might have walked by and said, oh, it's flooded let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> but uh, I think it, you know, I'm like, Oh, who is this guy? This guy is pretty cool. <laughs> I remember, I actually that was one thing I always tried to do. I would never try to present a problem to my and I still do that to this day, present a problem to my superiors without having at least two actions already being done to <laughs> solve that problem and a plan like, because it's like, hey, 
what good am I if I'm just like that bird that just dies <laughs> in the cave when gas like hits it, you know? Like, <laughs> and, but uh, yeah, I, I, I remember that day. Um, so, uh, so a couple of years uh, uh, in, you transferred into my group and then you uh, had a, a super productive a couple of years, um, got a, a, a couple of great papers, including what I consider to be uh, one of my lab's top two scientific discoveries, uh, and uh, that is the, uh, the orthogonal detection of beating cardiomyocytes using a piezoplasmonic mechanism. And I just can't believe that that experiment worked, but the data are just deadly and clearly it did work because there is no other mechanism to account for it. Um, um, and, uh, and, you know, a, a couple of rounds of reviewers that couldn't quite see the light, uh, but at nanoscale eventually uh, came through for us. But anyway, I always hold up that paper as like the, uh, uh, that, that and the biodegradable semiconducting polymer. But anyway. <laughs> like we still own that word too. If you Google piezoplasmonic. That's all you. That's, and, then, and then I get, uh, you know, half of the emails in my spam folder, or maybe 10%, maybe that's, that's no joke, are addressed to Brandon C. Marin for, uh, for some sort of plasmonic cell something or other. And sometimes even like American Society of Pediatrics is inviting you to a conference and sending it to me. But anyway, I digress. Um, so, uh, we are, um, we're, we're, uh, coming up on an hour now. I, I just want to give you, um, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to riff on a, on a few subjects in, in, in brief. Um, tell me about, you, you were, you were quite active with, uh, diversity organizations when you were at UCSD. And what is what does diversity mean to you? Um, and how do you think we can do a better job in STEM education and promoting it? Well, I mean, this is a good time to talk about this in general because of everything that's happening with uh, racism in our country. I mean, I, systemic racism has and I lead with systemic racism because this is the reason why we even pay attention to diversity, why we pay attention to minority groups and why we pay attention to, you know, um, um, affirmative action and things like this. Um, it's such a pervasive problem in this country that, that, you know, and it has been here for like centuries and centuries. I think to me, none of us, none of us directly own this this problem you know it's something inherited from our fathers and grandfathers and and so forth but but we definitely do own the the task to fix it and and to rectify it you know um because the system and i can attest to it just being on the other side of the judicial system in the united states the system is heavily weighted against minorities like in this in this country and um What's interesting is even over the last like few months, just being quarantined and learning more about um, uh, my own um, just like my own conceptions of like racism, that a lot of this is subliminal. Like it causes us to make actions that are like sometimes you don't even like, consciously make, you know, just because of like your your personal experiences. So for me, like diversity. Um, and I mean, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't mean to umbrella these terms, but just for the sake of brevity, we kind of have to. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, diversity is something like, because um, I wanted to tie that back into to the, um, to, to the diversity part. I think it's something that really needs to be um, encouraged and, 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 and ingrained into our culture, just both academic and just as a whole, I mean, I love, um, I love hearing stories about people that like that that grew up literally like, in poverty in other countries, and completely turn it around with this. This country is this is it's this is a great country. Like, don't get me wrong, like, it's it's a beautiful country, and it's definitely the resources here and the potential here is is limitless, you know. And this is a great area to thrive. So to hear people that like have gone through things and in, in, um, with um, uh, their, their, their backgrounds, like coming from other countries or the part of a, a minority population, like 
like hearing those stories and watching them thrive, like in, um, in, uh, like currently like in, in academia and even that where I work today is something that really, really gets, I, I love it. I mean, because I'm one of those stories. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, I'm a, I was, you know, my, my family, my, uh, grandparents were born in other countries in, in Mexico too, you know, like they're, um, and I'm part of a, a minority group. And I think for me, like, um, I think it's something that, that we don't pay attention enough to. And um, I, I try to do as much as I can personally to promote it and to, to help um, help it thrive, uh, just diversity and inclusion. And I mean, you were, kind of, you were aware of some of that when I was at UCSD. I mean, it was involved in SHIP and- um, Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers. Yeah. And um, I was the graduate ambassador for some time. And, uh, and I, loved, I loved my- my um, my work with SHIP and um, I mean it's such an, an awesome organization. They have so much going on and um, for me, like I've always wanted to uh, um, to be a part of that and just encourage it because my story is is very much one of those basically those boilerplate stories that comes out of a diversity pamphlet. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't call it boilerplate. If you had to look at the at the minimum and the maximum, like living on the street from the from the depths of the of living under this overpass in a cardboard box to getting clean, which is probably the the most difficult thing that you have done to getting your completing your BS to completing your PhD, then doing amazingly well and being an inventor on a, a phone book of patents uh, in your current uh, your current position is really uh, amazingly inspirational and goes way beyond uh, boilerplate. I not, not and not to mention winning the the highest award that my company has to offer recently. I can actually say that. Uh, con congratulations. What is the name of this? What is the name of the award? Uh, it's the Intel Achievement Award. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, it's kind of like a career award at our, at our company, and yeah. It's and and also, um, uh, also the highest uh, teaching award given to graduate students at uh, at UCSD too. So you are you are cleaning up. And um, uh, what are your what are your ultimate career goals now? career um you know career as it as it intersects with um with helping others right i mean for me um i think um i mean my lifelong purpose is is always like since 2007 has been to try to help as many people with the problems that i had as possible and by that i mean addiction and uh, alcoholism um that has always been my um, my purpose since then, but I think, uh, more directly, I, I really enjoy teaching and I really enjoy sh passing on my knowledge to other people. I mean, that much is apparent in Alcoholics Anonymous and even in academia and uh, industry right now, like, uh, that's, that's very apparent. And I feel like for me, um, my long-term goals are hopefully to get back into teaching and, and help people at the, um, at the university level. I think the way I describe it is I, you know, you have a battery and you put it in a certain appliance and it'll give electricity, but there's certain types of batteries for certain types of appliances. Right. And I feel like right now, like there's an appliance that maybe I could like, <laughs> you know, work better in, you know, and I think that that appliance like metaphorically is, um, is teaching. The things, the reason why I, I, I say that is because of the feedback that people have given me when they um, have worked with me with teaching. I mean, for me, what got me into teaching was that my teachers cared about me and they made me excited to learn. And I have heard from former students like, um, you know, Brandon, I didn't get this until you explained this to me. And I'm really, really grateful at this time when you were my TA, I really didn't want to be doing chemical engineering. I didn't really want to finish my major, but it really helped me get back on track. You got me excited to learn about this again. And that for me was like, that's awesome. And if I can couple that, like how you mentioned before with diversity, you know, like helping, um, helping diversity like flourish, like with our, um, our academic system, that's, that to me would be the perfect fit. I think right now um, I'm seeing a lot of that through on the industry level because it doesn't have to just be academia. It could be industry too. And right now 
I'm loving my job at Intel. I love um, the people I work with and I love uh, the programs that I'm involved with. And um, I can do that same mission statement here as well. But I think long term, something I'd really uh, love to get back into is just um, like full time teaching. And that's like, uh, I feel like we're the puzzle piece fits the best, you know, um, and I'm okay waiting until the perfect position pops up because I think my life up until this point can attest that I can attest that, um, that, you know, things happen for a reason, you know, um, the places you get rejected from to go to school, the jobs you get declined for and the people that you don't meet and do me all happen for a reason. And for me, I, <laughs> just over what I've explained over the last hour, I know that everything, this is part of a, of, a, of a grander plan. So I'm sure the opportunity will present itself. And when it does, I just want to be able to um, be willing to, to seize it. So, yeah. Awesome. What a great attitude. Um, and um, is there anything that you wish I had asked that I didn't? Um. Any, any parting words for the audience? Uh, I think, um, I mean, for anybody that, like, out there that's clicked with this story, I mean, it's, there's so much more to it than, than, than could just be summed up in an hour. Um, but, uh, you know, if anything kind of, kind of clicks, even with the addiction, you know, like, um, and you have that problem out there, uh, today, or you know somebody with that, I just want to be able to say that there is a solution because that was something that I, even at 22, 23 years old, when I finally got sober, I didn't know was out there, you know, and I, I wish somebody would just have black, flat out told me that there's, there's a way to, you know, to, to, to clean up and get sober. So that's the one thing I would want to say. And that, uh, and other than that, I'd like to thank you for, <laughs> um, for asking me to speak and, and having this wonderful conversation. I actually sure. always enjoy talking to you. So <laughs> I'm glad yeah. we got to, there's something I can actually look back and, and, and look it over again when I want to, uh, reminisce and, and, uh, yeah, it was absolutely my pleasure to have this conversation. And I think, uh, I think it will mean a lot to a lot of people. So thank you for sharing your story and your inspiration. And with that, uh, I've been speaking to Dr. Brandon Marin. Um, and thank you for tuning in. Take care.